Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Thanks so much for joining. Today will be a very much a, um, a learning day, sharing, reflecting together. I mean, we're all uh, somewhere around the world feeling affected by what's going on this year, but uh, we really hope sincerely that you feel reconnected to this movement that we're all part of and hopefully walk away inspired um, uh, with a lot of new content and new people that you've met. Um, so just to um, share a bit of the concept, uh, Rose, can you share the slide? I'm not sure if Rose is here. Rose? Yeah, okay, perfect. Perfect. Um, so like uh, uh, Peter said, warm welcome to you all. Uh, today we're going to go on a virtual mountain trail and we're actually going to arrive at the summit where we'll be celebrating some of the biggest lessons learned on regenerative agriculture and um, go through some of the, the um, yeah, insights and experience of some of the speakers that we've invited for today. Um, so just to give you a bit of a background, um, with, within Common Land, we of course work very closely with local partners who are also here today and I'll introduce them to you later. Um, and it's a growing group of uh, network partners um, all working in and on the landscapes together with farmers uh, and other stakeholders uh, that, that are interested and in, 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 in take part in that landscape. Um, usually we have once a year this learning festival where we get together, hug, drink beers, reflect on what's going on personally, on content, but of course that's not possible. So what we've been trying to do is sort of, yeah, uh, provide an alternative digitally that is still very much, you know, focused on content and learning together, but also, um, yeah, being able to connect, even if it's lightly and not compared to a week of offline, but uh, basically that's where this concept came from. But because it's online, we can also open up the windows and invite more people to join. So we really wanted to open up and have, have a conversation amongst a bigger group of people. So that's uh, where we are today. Um, yeah, and this is, this is the basic program. So uh, we'll go a bit into the lessons learned of what have we've learned over the past uh, six years, more or less. Um, and then uh, also which questions still remain in the field of regenerative agriculture. And then we'll have three speakers um, walking us through their experience in regenerative agriculture space from different perspectives, um, uh, which I'll, I'll introduce you uh, later. And then we'll have a bit of a break, so you can actually get some tea or coffee uh, during that time. Um, and after that, we'll have breakout rooms with uh, small groups of people where we can reflect a bit of what we've heard, what we've learned and what strikes us. Um, but we'll guide you through all of that. Uh, so there is a, an opportunity to talk to each other. Um, yeah, uh, let's go to the what have we learned. So um, interestingly, I mean, if we look back, we've been collaborating with Veiland, uh, Avalal, Living Lands Grounded, Wide Open Agriculture, and a growing group of partners in uh, Australia, the right lower corner, uh, since 2014, more or less. So there's different timelines, but let's put the marker in 2014 and we've been really collaborating as a growing four turns network of strong local landscape partners and they are really the ones that know and live in the landscape and we support them uh, as an enabler and sometimes a co-initiator of landscape restoration initiatives um, and you know interestingly a large part of what connects us as a network is that we we, we work with a theory you inspired approach on how you engage with people in and on the landscape, uh, as well as identifying uh, another aspect of our work is also identifying businesses that can help regenerate the landscape and create local economies of scale. Um, interestingly, however, is that one of the most spoken about and inspirational aspects of our collective approach to landscape restoration is really promoting a transition in agriculture uh, from intensive, uh, maybe conventional, towards more regenerative nature-based uh, forms of agriculture. And as such, we also feel that agriculture is really a driver for change. Um, and it can also spark business activity, inspiration, community involvement. I mean, yeah, this, this, this business development combined with regenerative agriculture is such a uh, um, catalyst for, for creating movement on the land. Um, and therefore it's unsurprising that the theme of this mountain trail was really voted as regenerative agriculture because it's such an important part of our work. Um, what I do want to note is that 
even though we are here online and Zoom is great and it's amazing that we can still um, connect, it's, it's good to, to realize that we are talking about, you know, on the ground work that also is sometimes really tough and can be, uh, uh, yeah, very complex. Uh, and you'll see it also in the lessons learned, but also the partners that we're looking at here, it's really rough. And um, it's also humbling, grounding work. So it's good to sort of, you are, you are all probably here because you are connected to this theme and also realize that it is about being on the land um, in, in the reality of life, uh, even though this digital space is, is super nice to connect. Um, yeah, um, so we've looked into our archives. We had a harvest sessions indeed with the harvest team. You just saw a, a split second. Um, so these are the, the faces really behind these lessons learned. And I don't know if we can probably do a bit of a wave with the harvest team later, um, but we really want to thank everyone uh, uh, within the harvest team for, for supporting this. So we have Matt from Living Land South Africa, uh, Laura from Alvalal, we have Liz from Living Land South Africa as well, Matthijs from Weiland, uh, Christy from Wide Open Agriculture Australia, Keith from Regen WA Australia, Seferino from Grounded South Africa, uh, and then uh, Vicky, Kira and myself from Common Land. And we've been really looking at the lessons learned over the past few years, reflecting on them, trying to distill the key elements of what really came out. Um, and uh, we'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a sense of what came out. Um, next slide. Right, so, I mean, there's lots to say, and we will publish and share more information, more things to read, but just a quick summary of what came out of, of this analysis of, of six years of working with regenerative agriculture. So one big lesson that we all picked up was, you know, it's so important when you're working on this to listen from a place of not knowing. If you return to nature, then it, the more you know, the less you know in a way. And we also noticed that it's important to think big about your dreams, but also really start small and act fast because we don't have a lot of time left and we can also um, sort of get lost in the big thinking too much. So it's good to find that balance of thinking big, starting small and acting fast. So that was a big lesson. Uh, the second one is, is very much that regenerative agriculture is one term, but it's definitely not one solution. And <clears throat> it can really take place on a continuum with a set of principles and it has no really particular starting point. There's a lot of diversity uh, as such. Um, and connected to that, is also the concept of number three, which is uh, that regenerative agriculture also requires a deep understanding of the ecosystem within, your, within which you're operating with your uh, farming uh, operation. So it's also finding an agricultural form that fits the landscape in terms of uh, water uh, resources, in terms of climate. Um, uh, and it's, it's an open door, but it was just such a good realization again, that if you want to have regenerative agriculture as a driver for change in a landscape, this is so key and it does take effort and time to understand the landscape. Lesson number four, there is a serious science evidence gap that we need to close. What a lot of uh, the harvesters also expressed was that they are trying to find this bridge between scientific research, peer reviewed research and the practice of actually getting change off the ground. And it, there is still, there is beautiful research going on, but not at the, the level that, that we can sort of convincingly, I mean, we could argue about that, but there, there was an impression in the lessons learned that we pulled that there was still a big gap and that it was also hard to find the right expertise um, that farmers were, were needing at that moment. So, so this is something to pay attention to. Number five, what we also found, which was really, really jumping out, uh, that's also why the drawing is jumping out, uh, was that farmer-centric networks are really the way to go and that soil health is the key to every farmer's heart. Uh, I mean, in, in uh, all of the landscapes that we collaborate with, and the partners can speak to that as well later, is, is this farmer, farmer to farmer exchange and really lowering the threshold of people being able to connect with each other, maybe feeling isolated in their alternative approach, but then connecting them to a growing network of farmers is such a powerful and uh, necessary approach. Last but not least, we also talked at different scales. And what we also realized is that there is a bit of a mismatch between diversifying farming systems and how current market infrastructure can absorb that. Um, and I mean, there are good examples of how you can market different products from one farm 
to different value chains, but it is still a, a bit of a trick to do that. Um, and, and there is, yeah, we, we found that it's still a big mismatch and it also requires this paradigm shift. And then the question is, do we want to fit into that system or can you use regenerative agriculture as a leverage for changing that infrastructure? Um, this is a really big summary. So there, there, we, we would love to go, go into conversations with you guys, but we've tried to yeah, keep it concise. Uh, but this is uh, yeah, the, the six biggest lessons learned. Yes, so this is, this is the, what I just presented came out of a couple of uh, yeah, sessions and rounds of uh, evaluating and distilling. Uh, and now we are slowly arriving at the summit, uh, but of course we, we, we can have the view on the mountain and look at where we want to go, but there are still some questions we have in view that we don't have answers to. And hopefully uh, the speakers today can, can inspire us related to some of those questions, um, but there are still some. Such as, so there are different scales here. So you have the supply system, the system supply chain level, the landscape level and the farm level. Um, and, and, and some general questions that we have on the left-hand side is for example, what, what is the, the, the big, the high over narrative of regenerative agriculture? Is there one? And, and what does that say about how you, need, how you can define it? Do we need to, um, in terms of verifying the quality of regenerative practices, et cetera? Uh, the other one is around uh, system and supply chain level. So if our supply chains do not match with smaller or medium-sized individual mixed farming systems, do we then indeed try to fit in or do we transform the supply chains, what I just mentioned. At the farm level, another, another interesting one is how, I mean, agri-technology is such an important uh, avenue to explore, but how do we prevent it from creating new dependencies uh, and, and really empower farmers through this, uh, through agri-technology. And now we've talked to Herbie, Herbie, Abby and Lenny, the, the speakers of today, and we pointed them to some of these questions that we still have. Uh, and they've tried their best to address some of them, even though, of course, they will also speak, uh, yeah, tell their own story. Um, is that it? Um, yeah. Any questions for clarification, you can put in the chat. Otherwise, we will proceed to the presentations. So um, again, this is the basic program. Right now, I would like to um, tell you that, you know, it's, if you have questions, hold on to them, write them down, put them in the chat, or just remember them, because we will uh, create space for you to engage on those questions uh, in the breakout groups. Uh, it's really about going into dialogue and creating group interaction around the content. Um, and uh, you can also use the break after the presentations to just write them down in detail if you, if you like. Um, but uh, yeah, let me kick off with introducing Hervé. So Hervé Dupied, he's, um, he's the first speaker of today. Uh, he works at Patagonia, uh, specifically on the environmental initiatives. Uh, and he's also the co-founder of Animo, which I hope he will tell a bit about. It looks uh, really interesting. Um, and then um, Hervé really sees adventure as a school of life. So protecting the environment as a civic duty. And he says, I humbly aim at participating in redefine, redefining what common values could be part of the social contract in our Western societies. This journey starts by questioning my own set of values and making sure they're able to sustaining life on our home planet. Beautiful. And a fun fact about Hervé is that um, he's actually moving back to his grandparents in France to, first of all, reconnect with family, but also reconnect with the rural life. So um, that's a fun fact. And it's good for you to know we invited Hervé because he can really share Patagonia's perspective on the future of regenerative farming. He's really done some investigating into that, including the concepts of food democracy, the continuum of regenerative agriculture and agroforestry practices, and, and, um, uh, and supply chain, of course, because that's also what Patagonia is uh, yeah, involved in. So uh, let's give the floor to Hervé and give a, a virtual <laughs> round of applause. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Willemijn, and uh, hi, everyone. So, yeah, um, I think indeed uh, when, when people now ask me what is my job at Patagonia as environmental initiative, it doesn't say a lot. So I tend to define it in, in a humble way, but saying that the company is trying 
humbly to redefine what are the core values that we share as part of the, of the social contract. Um, and I'll try to elaborate around that a bit also in my presentation and seeing uh, food systems and agriculture as a, one of the biggest solutions that we have at hand. Um, so if I may share, of course, a PowerPoint. Sorry, guys, you see that every day. <laughs> So I'll, I'll go quickly back uh, into the roots of the company so that you understand where we come from and why uh, agriculture and food systems are really important uh, for Patagonia. So the company um, was funded uh, by this man on the right called Yvon Chouina. He's the founder and he's still the sole owner of, of the company. And back in the days, you know, he was a climber and, and he was also a handcraft man. So he was designing his own pythons and those uh, iron pieces of metal, uh, you hammer them in the rock. And um, it was actually his first uh, recognition and, and clear uh, vision of how much he had an impact on nature and per se here on the rock itself. Um, it means that he, st he, he, he was a really good um, handcraft man and he was making quite some money to sustain his lifestyle as an adventurer. But he says, I'm going to stop that. And he stopped almost overnight because it was uh, damaging on a very long lasting period, uh, nature. And um, he could say, well, either I stop everything or either I'm going to try finding solutions. And of course, he was not stopping his adventures. And one of the biggest one that he did, and that was at the origin of the company, Patagonia, is this mountain here that you see, which is called the Fitzroy which actually gave the name uh, of our company because it's located down in Patagonia. And when you are on such a mountain in such environment, it's changing every 10 minutes for having been there and climbed there. You know, you can have uh, snow, uh, you can have a storm, you can have rain, uh, you can have minus 10, and then suddenly there is the, there is the sun coming up. It's, it's really challenging. And back in the days, you didn't really have the proper gear. So I decided to make that gear. And now Patagonia makes gear for those extreme sports. Um, we have definitely embedded into our values the sense of quality, uh, not only because quality means less consum consumption, but because also quality in those environments mean life or death uh, situation. Um, but another life or death situation when we look at the current system is, well, we have to pick up a side as a company, as human beings, part of that company. and I. I am humbly part of this company, which for the past 50 years have tried with its best capabilities and still looking at influencing the corporate and capitalistic world at not destroying, but protecting. Um, and that has given us our mission statement. And that simple sentence is driving most of the decisions and always more driving our decisions, if I may say, for the next decade, and especially we're in business to save our home planets planet. So our business is to save the planet. Our business is not per se to sell outdoor clothes. It's really to save the home planet because we are in a state of emergency and crisis and we need to act fast. So what we've done in the past and what we do even more now is that if you look carefully and if you know a bit Patagonia, we, we don't talk to consumers. Um, and I think that's the first thing to, 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 to see is that we've always been talking to responsible citizens. And that makes a huge difference because as a consumer, the society tells you, you have only rights. And those rights, uh, of course, are a mirage. They are just an illusion. But when you're a responsible citizen and you come to Patagonia, we make you feel also part of your responsibilities towards what you buy, because it has an impact, but also towards what you can do to help protecting the environment and save the planet. So that's why as a company, we really do believe that the real change happen through building grassroots momentum. Meaning that if you look carefully in history, the only way that positive social environmental change has ever happened, it's by building a movement from the bottom to the top. It never came from the top. It never came from the top politicians because they are always opportunistic when actually real people on the ground, they're not opportunistic, you know, they're visionaries and they fight for something that has never been done before. So they are not reactive, they are proactive. And as a company, we try embedding that into what we do. So that's why we created 1% for the planet. 
back in uh, we co-created uh, sorry we co-created that back in the 90s and it was a statement to say to ourselves we do damage the planet and we are not yet there at protecting it per se we still have a negative impact so we are going to tax our own selves and one percent we therefore give one percent of our sales to grassroots activism movements and therefore uh, we found those we found those movements because they are bold they are direct action oriented and they are commitment to the long-term change that we want to see so they they are not looking at the consequences of the current crisis they look at the root causes and therefore they are really challenging the system as it is and so we found um we, we tend to fund groups that are taking on the streets to confront the government with a simple statement is that as a government, you are elected, you are electing, uh, we elect you, sorry, to look after uh, ourselves, to protect us. But in light of the current crisis, you are not protecting us. And therefore we take the streets to demand you government to protect us as citizens in face of the climate ecological crisis and social crisis that comes with it. But we also fund groups that are taking on the courts. So there is many ways and many paths to apply our democratic uh, leverages as responsible citizens. But as Patagonia, uh, what I've just said is everything we've been doing for the past decade. But now we need to go deeper also as a company for looking, uh, taking a harsh look at what we do as the company, but also try helping new other movements in other fields. So those are the kind of the four main fields that we are looking at as a company. Today, I will, of course, focus on the agricultural one. And starting with the place that you all know here, I think, is that we have a growing problem, which is soil, um, which is being depleted at a very fast scale. And we do recognize that as Patagonia because we are very dependent on agriculture. The way we grow our cotton as a company that we grow organically for the past at least 20 years, um, organic is not enough. And um, we wanna make sure that we can use agriculture as a company to bring products on the market that may be carbon positive, but also that um, you know, have an impact on the farmers themselves, a, a positive social impact. So that's why we created, we co-created this regenerative organic certification which is pretty much now live in the US. And that certification is about saying, we wanna go beyond organic. We wanna help um, responsible citizens, consumers to identify what is really good for their health, what is also very good for the farmers and, 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 and let's say the food systems working with decent conditions on the top level farming practices that are currently available. So it's another certification, but we, we, we do see it as an important thing, sorry, because uh, organic is also taken now by big agribusiness and is watered down from its meaning. Um, and it's a bit like sustainability, like sustainability does not mean a lot anymore. You know, you can put a lot in there, like actually regenerative only. But when you start from a basis, basis of something that is protecting, meaning organic, then you can build upon, I'd say, a first healthy, good step soil. And then you can build upon re a regenerative philosophy, which, which go beyond, which look at the soil, which look at enhancing biodiversity, water retention, and so on and so forth. So as a company, we definitely use that regenerative organic principles and certification for our own supply chain to transform the way we produce, for example, our natural fiber like cotton, most of our, our cotton and organic cotton is coming from India. And so uh, for the past couple of years, we've started a, um, a pilot on regenerative organic with more now, I think that, uh, that 800 uh, farmers, which uh, are very small scale Indian farmers. And we do a regenerative organic pilot with them so that we can start launching products that um, indeed are embedding uh, those, those practices uh, into, into the supply chain. But then it's not enough. And I'm sorry, it's a bit of text, but let me read it for you. As I read this, the pandemic we are experiencing has warned me that perhaps the days of buying expensive gear and plane tickets to travel halfway around the world to fish, ski, climb and surf may be over, if not greatly reduced, but we still need to eat. 
in fact, I think the only revolution we are likely to see is in agriculture. And I want to be part of that revolution. So those are the words of our founder and owner, uh, Yvon Chouina. And it's quite interesting if you pay attention to those couple of sentences is that <laughs> the guy um, is questioning its own business model around expensive closings um, and is actually seeing that, you know, agriculture is a revolution that is already happening and that he want to be part of it. And so that's why as a company, which is in outdoor closes, we also created a provision uh, meaning a food business, which is still small, but is, it's growing. And it's starting on the basis of providing really healthy food for outdoor sports. Uh, as you can see, those are kind of conditioned um, um, processed food, I mean, in, in, in packages that you can easily have with you when you're in the mountains. It was the kind of the natural way from uh, outdoor sports that we definitely try representing and, and the food that we need. But it's a way also to question the way, of course, we grow the food, uh, the way we can support farmers and offer them a way out um, those food systems that are really, you know, putting them in clench uh, between bank loans and always bigger mechanization and so on and so forth. So it's definitely a way to, to, to question responsible citizens and food is something that uh, all of us are very much viscerally uh, connected to and, and we try to get our consumers closer to that. And <clears throat> back to two things that I said, you know, our mission is we're in business to save our home planet and we do want to fund bold direct action and commitment to long-term change. And if you take those two assumptions and if you look indeed in agriculture, well, actually, farmers are those grassroots activists that we've been funding uh, through NGOs for the past. But if you look carefully, farmers, they do represent both of those assumptions. And as Patagonia, we definitely want to support not only small-scale farmers, but here it's, it's a farm in France. Um, this one is the farm um, Canada. Um, and if you look carefully, those people they question not only what type of farming practices um, we are going to apply for the future in terms of regenerative, but they definitely question also the way we look at social ecosystems because the environmental crisis is a human crisis. It is a social crisis. And back to what I was telling you at the beginning, what is my job is humbly, I'd like to really try questioning what are the common values we share as part of the social contract? Is it about being disconnecting and living in small apartments in the cities and not really feeling connecting to anything else than my computer? Or is it about actually being in a field, um, maybe in a community supported agriculture, feeling connected to my food, to the farmers, and therefore questioning deeply what is really essential to our lives? And back to also what Yvon said, maybe it's not that essential to take a, a plane and travel all around the world to ski, fish, and climb. Maybe you will find joy and something deeply meaningful around the corner in a small scale farm or a larger scale farm that you feel connected to. I see that Joost was, was on the call, you know, with his cows, I feel he has the potential to really connect people. Um, and, and this is really um, questioning how food systems are done. Are they currently very democratic? I don't think so. I think they are really owned by just a little of corporations that have, they, they don't really care about uh, connecting consumers to the farmers. They care about profit. They don't care about uh, how much that system could become a healthy solution for new societies in the future, because we will never solve the environmental crisis if we do not solve also the social crisis that we see around us. And it's a bit cliche, but I'll, I'll, I'll finish the presentation by a quote from Jean-Martin Fortier, who is a a small scale farmer in, 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 uh, in Canada. And he says, this future, he's talking about a, a future which would be far from agri-industrial world, will be ushered in by people who feel compelled to spend their days outdoors with hands and feet in the dirty ground, working directly with the forces of nature and making a tangible contribution to the well-being of their communities. And I was reading that article from Jean Martin and I was like, it is incredible because in those three lines, he has I mean, he has exactly expressed what Patagonia stands for in the outdoors. This is exactly what we, what we 
what we stand by, days in the outdoors, be with the dirty ground, work directly with the forces of nature, and make a tangible contribution to the well-being of their communities. That's what we stand for in the outdoors. And I'm like, well, why don't we do the same in agriculture now as Patagonia? And that's what we are looking at. And um, yeah, thank you very much, guys. I hope I was not too long. I, I think I kind of kept into the 15 minutes. That's perfect. <laughs> thank you so much, Hervé. Really beautiful quote to, to end with. Uh, and it almost paints a picture of, uh, yeah, it, it's almost like a future, like a, an image of the future of, of how our lives uh, could be in terms of what we prioritize and uh, find important. Thanks so much. Um, we will have time to reflect on your talk and, and um, you will probably be one of the breakout groups. So one, one of the uh, sure. groups, yeah. Um, thanks. And um, next up is our friend Lenny Martinez. Um, Lenny is a French, has French Spanish origins, but is currently living in Berlin. So he's really uh, uh, European to the bone, you could say. Um, uh, Lenny uh, works for One Two Three. It's an impact investment agency, uh, really aimed at mobilizing institutional investment into sustainable land uses at large scale. Um, at One Two Three, they also apply regenerative agriculture, really as a term to refer to a holistic holistic system of practices and principles. Uh, they follow to manage their portfolio of land. So um, we invited Lenny today because he has some experience in, and insights into multi-crop uh, regenerative farming systems and how uh, those can be marketed and also the uh, engaged investor perspective. So we thought that might be a nice mix. Uh, and a fun fact about Lenny is that he actually never ate chocolate until he visited a cocoa farm and discovered bean to bar single origin products in his mid twenties. Uh, since then, he has really made up for the for the uh, the lack of uh, chocolate so far. And the and, and uh, he also collects the wrappings of bean to bar chocolate. So that's good to know. Uh, Lenny, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to share like a video um, yeah. of the farmers because for me it's extremely important to to. Uh, see faces behind the farmers. So I, I just want to share with you a quick video on one of our farms in Costa Rica. Sí, yo empecé trabajando en el 93 y conforme han pasado los años se ha aumentado la estructura se ha hecho más grande se han hecho cambios de una forma de otra se ha ido poniendo todo bonito mejorando siempre y cuidando el ambiente no maltratando los bosques ni los humedales también se ha ido reforestando más y más ahora está súper bonito ahí para adentro ahí usted se encuentra con toda clase de animales Es muy bonito. Vivimos eh, eh, con, revuelto con la naturaleza. Y eso es lo que los hijos míos han visto también. Ellos han crecido y han ido viendo todo el proceso. Y ahora, a, ahora tenemos que como 20 años de trabajar en, en Platanera. Aquí nos tratamos todos, bueno, a, toda la vida nos hemos tratado igual. So I'm Lenny Martinez, I'm the duty manager. As, as you said, I'm French and Spanish, but I'm currently live, I currently live in, in Berlin, in Germany. So I want to present you a one, two, three, what we do. Um, for, but first of all, for me, um, I'm not a big fan of sustainability, like as a word, um, and I really value the, the diversity of our team and what I want to say here, like sustainability requires a teamwork. I, I really value um, the diversity of the team. We have uh, investment managers, we have system team manager, we have farmers. So we are, we are really a big team based in different countries. And for me, it's extremely enriching to, to work with um, different nationality and different professional and academic backgrounds. So what I want to present you today, so I want to present you one to three first, but also to highlight one of our farm, which are most advanced in terms of regenerative agriculture.
This farm, as you as you have seen before, is um, is a banana farm in Costa Rica, close to the border with Panama. And I also want to uh, present our KPIs and the challenge we face to measure the impact of the farms. And I think it's really important to to have a very clear and transparent way uh, how we farm, how we 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 measure the impact of, of the different farms we have. So one to three is a pretty young company. We, the company was created about three years ago, four years now, um, when, we, when we got a mandate from a German pension fund to invest in forestry, agroforestry and agricultural projects. So when I say invest, so we invest in farms, well, single estate plantations um, in different countries, but we are not only investing in this plantation, we are also managing uh, these farms. So as you can see here on the graph, so we, we are an asset manager, uh, but we also have a very strong operation team based in, in, in Colombia and Panama uh, to manage all the farms. And obviously each farm is a company, so each farm has a, has a big team to, to manage um, the, the, the project. So one to three, uh, we also uh, sell the production. So we do everything. So we manage the farm and we also sell the different uh, products we, we produce in the different farms. So we have a, a team here in Berlin to sell the, the production um, of cocoa because we have mainly cocoa farms, but I will present to you afterwards the leaf and farm we have in our portfolio. So here, as you can see, we have um, we have quite, we have invest, um, invested in the last uh, three years in 12 different farms uh, in seven countries. Here you cannot see one of the last farm we have invested in, which is in, located in, in Morocco. It's a date olives organic plantation. Um, so here the, you can see most of our farms are located in, in Ecuador, Colombia, Panama, Guatemala, and the Dominican Republic. So we have um, in the portfolio for the moment, uh, seven cocoa farms. Um, most of them are not only cocoa farms because we have different uh, products in these farms. We have, uh, so, so the goal of the company is to establish agroforestry systems. So we have different crops in the farms, but the main production is cocoa. Um, and we have also different cocoa products. We have, uh, um, as you may know, like we have CCN51, which is a very, productive uh, cocoa variety, but we also have uh, fine flavor cocoa uh, where, and we sell this production to, to different uh, chocolate buyers. Uh, so we, we sell this production also to, to, the, to the industry, uh, the cocoa industry, but we also work with, um, with bean to bar chocolatiers uh, in the US or in Europe. And that's part of my job also to, to sell this production particularly the, the fine flavor uh, to, to be in Touba chocolatiers uh, in, in Europe. Here, so um, I want to talk about the vision of, of one to three. So we are, we want to be a regenerative, a regenerative company, but we are not yet there. So for us, it's, um, we, we, we really want to uh, progress on our approach and also learn from, from other companies, other projects, uh, but here, as you can see on the screen, like the, the, the graphic uh, um, is um, like our the, the kind of our deal uh, um, farms we want to, to support. So you see like agroforestry systems um, and also post harvest center, we want to improve the quality of the production. Um, so far we have invested in, in cocoa farms where the, they used to sell the cocoa wet. So without any fermentation and drying processes and we have built um, post harvest center to improve the quality of the production and also um, set up the right protocols uh, with, with our partners, buyers. I also mentioned precision agriculture because it's also part of our job to uh, decrease the amount of, of fertilizers and, and water and, 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 and also, um, yeah, also organic um, fertilizer we use. So we, we really want to have a very precise vision of the of the resource we use. And as you see, like we have in almost of our farms, we have a big area of conservation forest or bio corridors. That's very important for us. So in the portfolio, we have around 30% of, of, of conservation forest um, in, in the farms. 
and something extremely important for me and, and for the companies also to establish um, links with the producers around the farm. So we, we create um, a small farmer project close to the, to the main one to three farm. So the mandate we received is to invest in, in, in plantations, but we really want also uh, to collaborate uh, with, uh, with people and, and producers uh, close to these, uh, to these farms. So we have uh, set up different um, small farmer projects close to the, to the one to three farms. The first one is in Guatemala, um, uh, close to the, one of the, the, the farm we have invested in uh, is Hacienda Chimelp. Uh, this is a, a very nice multi-crop farms we have there. Cardamom, we have cocoa, we have coffee, uh, we have um, limon. So we have different products, but we also want to collaborate with, um, with the farmers close to this farm. So we have created together with um, an NGO called Haife Guatemala, a program with cocoa and cardamom producers. And the idea is first to, to understand the needs of these farmers. So we don't have like one vision where we want to replicate in all the farms. We have the idea of building a project with the, with the farmers, but we really want first to learn uh, the needs and, and, and set up together a project with, with these uh, small farmers. So that's kind of a, the idea we want to, 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 to establish in all the farms. So, we, so, so far we have uh, three different um, uh, small farmers projects, but we want to establish more, more projects close to these uh, farms. So now I want to, to, to present you like um, one of the farms, uh, Platanera Rio Xixaola, which is a banana plantation you have seen before. Um, one of the farmers, uh, one of the farmer in, in this plantation. That's um, kind of a hold banana plantation, a 30 years um, hold. We have invested in this plantation about um, uh, two, three years now, two, two years. Um, and so, so we are we really value the work that has been done before, and we also want to uh, go um, beyond this, the the work that has been done before. So that's a banana plantation with Cavendish banana, and also we have uh, red macabu, which are these uh, small bananas in the, on the link side. And uh, we we also have a um, big plot of uh, melina trees. Um, to create on the farm pallet uh, to export the banana on this pallet. So we, we we create our own pallet based on the on the on the Medina trees. And we also have a bio corridor that you can see here on this on the left on the right side. So we 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 really value um, the mosaic the, the different landscape at the farms. Um, so it's it's kind of uh, we have it's a it's established plantation so we we so the, the idea is we will not uh, plant other crops um, in these farms but uh, we we want to um, improve um, the, the the geometry work and one of the main activity on our list is to also um, make more research on on the way we farm the farms and also on the biodiversity side we haven't been doing a biodiversity report to, to see, uh, to track the biodiversity of the farm, but we really want to, to, to spend more time and energy to uh, do more research on this farm and also uh, plant uh, native mixed forest instead of melina. Uh, um, and one of the, the, the work I'm currently working on is um, living wage. And that's a big topic for, for the industry, not only for banana, but also for, for cocoa. We really want to um, first improve the methodology on uh, assessing and, and defining what does a decent living wage mean. But we want also close the gaps if there is one. So that's um, something I'm currently want, working on with, with the team to, to really have a, a better understanding of, um, of the current um, gap on the farms and not only on this farm, but also on other farms. Uh, what I want to mention on the economic side, so these farms used to be almost bankrupt when we entered into this project. Um, the productivity was 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 very low, and um, and they were like kind of finding a buyer uh, to buy the production. So now we, for us, it's 
we have found a, a buyer, which is uh, Rewe. It's a big supermarket in, in, in Germany. They are buying the production from this farm, the, the entire production from the farm. But we really want to increase the, the productivity without depleting the salt. But we also choose to not be so productive as other farms in Costa Rica. We really want to keep um, the, 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 the sustainability work. Um, but yeah, we, we have a, a premium. Uh, we have got a premium to value the work we have been doing in this farm or the farm has been doing. So that's also for us like a good thing and we can continue to, to work and, and support all the, the sustainability work that I've been doing before. Now I want to, to, to present you like kind of framework how we, um, we assess the impact of our farms. So I want to present you uh, some of the KPIs we have been, um, we have been implementing and, and collecting a lot of information. And that's part of my job to, to, to collect information from, from the different farms, from the farm managers and, and the team and, and, and have a, a better understanding of, of the way of how we farm uh, the different projects. So we have different category uh, to, to assess um, our impact. And I'm not, I'm not mentioning here the, the economic aspect, but part of our systemity approach is also to have key metrics on, on the economic side. And I can actually share with you afterwards the metrics we have to, on, on the economic side. But now I want to focus on, the, on these two environmental and social aspects. So for each, we have kind of uh, three different themes to measure the impact of the farms. So as you can see on the screen, resource efficiency was extremely important. Climate, climate adaptation and mitigation, that's obviously a big topic because we see the impact of climate change in the different farms. So we need to adapt and find ways to, to plant more trees to, to really uh, set up um, and support diverse um, crops. So we are not only uh, re relying on one single crop protecting and enriching biodiversity. That's also a very important topic for us. We want to, uh, in the conservation forest, we will, we, 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 we want to, to support um, the diversity in, this, in, this, in, this, um, in these forest areas. On the social aspects, um, safe and qualified jobs, um, that's a big topic and I will present you the, the KPIs, local interaction and inclusion, good working condition. And for E themes, we have, uh, KPIs um, and indicators. So as I mentioned, we have about 100 indicators to measure the impact of the farms. And from these 100, we have um, almost 20, which are our KPIs that we communicate to, to our clients and also to, to, to the investors. But we can also show the, the full report we have for each, for, for, for each farm to so the 100 indicators. For us, it's, it's extremely important to, to be transparent and show the current state of the farms, but always try to improve the way we, 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 we manage the farm. So the progress dimension is, is extremely important uh, for one to three. So here, as you can see on the screen, so uh, we have uh, KPIs and one of the, the main, like one of the main important thing is to learn. And so we provide and we want uh, to give the opportunity to, to, the, to the staff on the farms to learn from, from other projects and also to, to, to be part of, um, of academic training so we can always improve the way we manage the farm. And that's also very important for the team locally. Uh, local interaction and inclusion I mentioned before. Uh, so we, we really want to collaborate with, uh, with, with farmers um, and uh, cooperatives close to the farms, close to the, to the one to three farms. So that's, uh, that's very important. And also on the good working conditions, I mentioned before living wedge, which is um, yeah, an important uh, uh, topic. And we, we want to, offer the possibility to have a, a bonus on the farm for the farmers, not only based on the productivity side, but also on, on the social and, and environmental aspects so that they really want to share with, with the farms, with, the, with their colleagues. So that's, that's the thing we want, we, we are introducing in all the, the farms to kind of not only giving a bonus on the productivity, but other components. Eleni, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, how much longer do you need? Um, I think five minutes, five, between five and 10. 
Well, I think we have maybe one minute left because I'm going to create space for Abby. Yeah. Okay. 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 So just I wanted what I wanted to say, like the the KPIs or KPIs are like uh, not um, impact indicators, and that's something that we really want to to improve. Uh, because um, these are like progress indicators and, and what we want to see and what the investors and, 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 and colleagues we want to see that the impact we achieve on the farms and that's something we need to improve. Um, yeah, just me, um, I will just uh, present these slides. Um, that's present the vision we want to, to, to where we want to go. So as I mentioned before, we have different themes uh, for each topic. But we really want to track progress. So we, when we collect information, uh, we collect information just after acquiring the farm, and and also every year we collect information. But that's also one important uh, is to think is to uh, set targets. So we we have um, we have also targets for each uh, KPI, so we can really uh, have a, a way to go where we want to go. Uh, maybe like uh, 10, 10 seconds on this slide. So we, we still have a lot of things to do to be a regenerative company. Um, so we, we have um, sort of four, four main topics. Uh, the first one I mentioned before, we really want to be to work more with research institutes and um, I've been um, uh, implementing partnerships with ECRAF, the World Agroforestry Center and the SIAT to, to also invite students and, 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 and research uh, uh, um, partners to 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 visit the farms and and also develop kind of um, plot uh, research plot on our farm. That's uh, something we really want to to do uh, more. Also, we want to uh, to invest in uh, uh, kind of experimental uh, regenerative farms to um, uh, develop different designs of the farm. So and 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 choose different species according to the soil. So that's that's something we want we, we want to develop. And uh, last point, net carbon balance. So we have um, a good like overview of the, the, the sequestration of the farms, but we need to improve on the net carbon balance because obviously as a farm manager, we also emit uh, carbon. So we, we want to um, assess the net carbon balance of the, of the farms, of the one to three farms. Thank Beautiful. you. Thanks so much, Lenny. Um, and I'm, I'm sure, are we, is it possible to share the slides afterwards? Of course, yes. And there were lots of questions to you, Lenny, in the chat. So we'll make sure to uh, get those to you if we don't address them in this webinar. Uh, so thanks so much. There's so much to say about regenerative agriculture. This is just your presentation also shows there's a world of stories we still need to tell. So I, I promise you all that when these measures are uh, wind down, we will organize some cool event on regenerative agriculture live so we can spend some time together because this is just the beginning. Um, thanks again, Lenny. Uh, um, and I would like to now give the floor to Abby Rose. Um, so Abby is calling in from England um, and she is a farmer and soil health advocate. Uh, she was also named one of the 50 new radicals by The Guardian. Uh, and Nesta in 2018 for her work, uh, amongst others, on Vida Cycle Tech. So she's developing simple apps that help build ecology, profitability, and beauty on farms around the world. Um, so the apps uh, really, and she will talk a bit about that, the apps really focus on using observation on farm to understand the, the farm's specific ecosystem uh, with a focus on building soil health. Um, they're, they're used on farms and vineyards on multiple continents. She's also the host, uh, the co-founder of Farmerama Radio, uh, which we'll share with you afterwards. It's a really cool podcast. Um, and of course, Vida Cycle, which I just mentioned. Uh, and she's, she's a part-time farmer on the family farm in Chile, uh, Chile uh, which she'll talk about a bit. Uh, we invited Abby because she can take us on the journey uh, into the possible risks and opportunities of agri-technology. Um, in, in the regenerative agriculture revolution, if, if we want to call it that. Uh, a fun fact is that Abby is driven by beauty uh, and she told us she's not really good at fun facts. So uh, that's a fun fact as well. Um, Abby, uh, are you ready to go? All right, floor is yours. Great, thanks. Um, 
And thanks, Lenny and Hervé. Yeah, really great to hear from you both. And also thanks for all the learnings. Um, I feel like I'm really excited by everything you guys are doing at Common Land. And I really appreciate, you know, all the work that's going on across multiple continents here. And it feels, um, I'm, thank you for sharing your learnings, I guess, because that's something that, you know, that enriches us all and that's how we can all kind of grow together. So that's really important. Um, Hey, uh, Abby, you, your sound was perfect in the beginning and then it went down. Okay, it's these headphones. I'll just get rid of them. Ah, okay. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, sorry, apologies. I was just saying thank you to you all for everything, um, for sharing all the knowledge um, and I really appreciate all the learnings and some of the questions as well. I've got me questioning, so that's really exciting. And the more we can all you know, grow together, that does feel like a really important part of what regenerative agriculture and this whole movement is. So I really appreciate that and thank you. Um, so I'm gonna, I do have some slides um, and I'll share my screen with you all. Um, okay, start on the first one. So, as um, Wilhelmine said, um, my family, uh, I got into farming really because my family started farming about 15 years ago. Um, our, this is a picture of our farm right here. It's a small farm in Chile. Um, we have uh, vines and we have olive trees. We also have almonds, pistachios, um, and then we make all our own, uh, grow our own food and fruits on site as well. So it's quite a mixed farm and we're farming about 30 acres essentially. And then there's quite a lot of natural habitat that is left untouched. And then you can see we're surrounded by mass pine forestry systems. <laughs> um, so that's our neighbor and that's what we contend with. Um, and so our farm is called Vita Cycle Farm. Um, and then it was really out of that that my uh, technology pursuits started. And that's where Vita Cycle Tech comes from. Um, because we really had some needs on our own farm, you know, in that for that size farm, there just weren't that many offerings out there of how we could keep track of our olive trees. You know, it was impossible to tell how one was doing from one year to the next. So I created a system that uses the phone alongside some NFC or contactless tags to allow us to better keep track of how each tree is doing um, and start to see trends over time of what is changing out in the field. And we now have a version of that for vineyards. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about how it applies to soil health as well. Um, before that, I also make a podcast called Farmerama. And that is very much about sharing the voices of regener behind regenerative farming and really, yeah, it's sharing knowledge as much as we can so we can all learn together and be aware of what's going on. So definitely recommend listening in um, if you're interested in all of this, which I assume all of you are. <laughs> Um, so in terms of Vita Cycle Tech, which is um, the software side of things, you know, our mission is to build ecology, profitability and beauty on farms around the world. Um, and we do that in a number of ways, but as Willemine said, um, Willemine, sorry, I'm saying your name wrong all the time. Oh, good. Willy, Willemine. Willemine, okay, Willemine says, um, I don't even remember what I was saying, so apologies. Um, beauty? I think beauty. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Okay. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah. Oh yeah, well this is what you said, is our focus is on observation. So although we're creating technology um, and we're using technology as maybe a better word, what we're actually focused on is farmer observation. And I think, you know, well, this is what I really realized on our farm is that every single farm is different. Um, and so the best thing you can do is observe and learn about like that particular farm and land that you're on and what are the trends there, like what's changing year on year there um, and how can you best work with that. So really our technology focuses on elevating those observations so that you can both use your own intuition around them and what you remember happened, but then also use data alongside that to support those insights and observations. Um, and so we have 
two main apps. Um, one's called Soil Mentor and one's called Sector Mentor. And <clears throat> as you can see here, um, it's, you know, it's about doing things like earthworm counts and then recording how many earthworms you counted at specific location in a field. And then you can go back to the exact same location the year after, count earthworms again, and start to see, you know, how is my earthworm number changing as I'm changing my management practices. Um, so yeah, we have a very strong focus on those very low, it's kind of like low tech tech. Um, and that, I guess that really, as I say, was born out of the needs of our farm initially. And now we work with farmers all over the world. Um, and it's really exciting to see, like I'm in a really privileged position, I guess, where I get to see the photos from all these different farms and all the different soil pits all over the world and really starting to build up a very rich picture of what's going on. Anyway, so that's kind of a background of me and really what I'm focused on today is actually not what I create, but more some of the questions that you guys brought up, which I was really excited about. Um, and the two key questions initially were, how do we prevent new agri-tech from creating new dependencies? And how do we ensure agri-tech empowers farmers? Um, and I think those questions hit right at the heart of why I never call myself agri-tech, um, because I think there's basically ever since um, Climate Corp was bought about six or seven years ago for $900 million, there's been a rush in the tech world to invest in agri-tech companies um, because suddenly tech investors could see that there would potentially be this, you know, big selling off, a big exit where they could make a lot of money, essentially. And so there has been huge investment in agri-tech um, and I think we need to ask some big questions. So I'm going to start with my concerns um, and then I'm going to move into more positive space. Um, so I think one of my, one big concern is that, um, you know, as, as a technologist, I do have some background in technology and working in tech for good. Um, I can see that, you know, there's lots of technologies coming like, like AI, like drone technologies, robotics. Um, and I think, you know, we're not going to stop them coming. Um, so it's an, it's a moment where we kind of get to engage or not. But what I see happening is that there's a lot of free software that's coming onto the market, um, focused on farmers. Um, and what it does is it uses farmers who are diligently going out there recording things in the field to train machine learning algorithms. Um, and then those companies can then sell those algorithms um, or can sell that data to, you know, large corporations, essentially. Um, and I think what's really dangerous about that is it builds some really big data asymmetries. Um, and what happens is the value of all that data that we put in and that we got a service back for free is then moved away from the farm gate. So one example here is one soil. I just, one thing I do want to be clear about is that I don't think one soil are like bad people or a bad company or anything like that. I don't think they're evil. Um, I think what I've noticed is almost everyone in the ag tech space is really well-meaning and they really want to help save the planet. And they see that, you know, helping optimize farming is one way of doing that. Um, and, you know, they're not necessarily aware of the distinction that not all farming is necessarily good for the planet. Um, and, and I think that's something, you know, we can help them learn. Um, but I think one soil is an interesting example because they are categorizing every field across the planet. Um, and then if you just look in the bottom here, they, you know, what they're selling actually is one soil business insights. And they said, we've harnessed these technologies to launch a service that provides statistics for businesses. You know, so that's their business model. Um, and what I think is particularly worrying about this example is that if you look at what it is they're categorizing, you know, they're categorizing commodities and monocultures, essentially. So what they're doing is they're building an a artificial intelligence or an algorithm that can categorize monoculture. And what I don't see in that is like 
companion cropping, agroforestry, uh, you know, multi-layered systems. How are they going to fit into this one, so one soil algorithm from satellite model? Um, and if they don't fit, how are pension funds going to be able to invest in them? How are, you know, all these people who are going to start relying on this technology in order to uh, understand their kind of investment portfolio, for example, is going to become a problem. Um, and so what, what I find interesting about this is we're embedding the status quo in the technologies we're building today. Um, and that that's potentially dangerous because once the technology is built and once the AI has learned, they're going to look to commercialize this. They're not looking to then you know, develop it over the next 10 years and change it all the time. Um, and so we could end up with, a, well, further entrenching the systems and the status quo. Um, I think, yeah, so building intelligent systems that optimize the status quo and the fact that it's free, you know, where is the value of that data going to be really reaped? Really, it's going to be reaped by the business insights that are then going to further entrench us in markets that we don't want to be part of. <laughs> um, so it's a real vicious cycle quickly, uh, you know, quickly descends. And then I think, you know, the other concern is the business model. So, you know, if all that data was co-owned by all the farmers in the world that they were categorizing, maybe that wouldn't be such a bad thing. You know, maybe that would feed back the value of the data would feel back to the feedback back to the farmers. Um, but if it's owned by a few investors who are looking to, you know, make an, a 10, 100x on their investment, um, they're not going to, you know, leave that lightly and they're going to look, the money has to come from somewhere and who's going to lose out essentially. So, yes, degenerative business models don't help. So I put together a few red lights. Villamine um, asked me for some red lights. And I think, you know, it's not black and white, any of this. It's not clear cut, but I'm wary of any technology that promises me answers. I think, you know, technology that asks questions and helps maybe take me on a journey is um, often more helpful than one that tries to give me answers or tell me what to do and when. Um, I'm wary of any tech company that puts technology as a front and center if what they're selling is that they've got robots or they've got AI. Um, they're implying that the technology is what's going to save us. And I, I think that that is always um, problematic because they probably often I find those companies don't really have an understanding of the farming behind the technology. They're just interested in the technology. Um, I think it's always good to be wary of free technologies. I'm not saying all free technologies are bad. I just think it's good to ask questions about why it's free and what are you really selling? Um, for example, you know, ask questions of the business model. Who is their customer? What are they selling? Who's going to benefit from this? And if they are ventured back, and if they are a venture backed company, you know, who might they be selling to in the future? So if you're making all the, you're going out taking photos of your grass now, you know, may it be that they're going to then sell to, um, Monsanto, for example, to take the, um, and that then Monsanto will suddenly own all the data that you've collected. So, you know, really thinking about that early on is important. Um, and then I also, you know, not to be all negative, I think, I personally think technology can provide a lot of positive support. Um, and I think, you know, the Regen Network in the US, I think it's really exciting to see what they're doing with carbon credits. They're offering not just the carbon credit, but they're showing like what are all the co-benefits around it. Um, so you know whether that's animal welfare, whether that's soil health, whether that's biodiversity. So really sewing in, you know the the very complex benefits that come with regenerative agriculture, sewing that into the carbon framework. I think that's really exciting, and that's an example where you know they're using blockchain, but they don't really talk about it um, and actually they're sewing in this very complex system into what they're offering. Um, and I think Open Team as well in the US, which is a collaboration of many different uh, companies, universities, um, people all coming together and talking about technology and how it can support what they're doing. And I would love to see something like that in Europe um, because it is a really vital part of the 
the ecosystem. You know, we don't want to get to a place in 20 years time where, you know, we've had a good go at regenerative agriculture, but actually none of the technology is part of it. And therefore it's like perpendicular worlds. That I think would be a disaster because, you know, technology is coming and I just think we can't avoid that. Um, so other uh, examples, I'll just pick a few out. Like I think, you know, there's a free app out there called Seek. I don't know if any of you guys have seen it, but it can help you in real time identify like fungi, plants, animals on your land. Um, and it's amazing. And I use it all the time on my family's farm in Chile um, to identify what different weeds are because I don't necessarily know what they are. Um, and it gives me this whole, um, you know, it just it's information at my fingertips that actually is really helpful for me to then go inform my regenerative farming plans essentially. Um, and then also, you know, we can't deny things like uh, solar pumps. Um, you know, that is a huge, on our farm in Chile anyway, you know, we use solar pumps all the time to pump to gravity. Um, and that's what really allows for the water management on our farm. So I think we really need to acknowledge that technology can be an amazing tool and support for what we're doing. And it, it just needs to be used wisely. Um, and the more we can engage with that, um, the better. So I had some kind of closing thoughts on that about how might we answer you know, your questions. So how do we prevent new agri-tech from creating new dependencies? One way I could see common land or, you know, I don't know who will do this, but if we could create a clear framework for what is, what are the regenerative technology principles? You know, what are, what is it that we want to work with as regenerative agriculture in terms of technology? You know, do we want to have data agreements to ensure that at the farm gate, all of the data um, is fairly rewarded? Um, or maybe we want to invest ourselves and have farmer back technologies or have crowdfunding for farmer back technologies um, and then allocate that to different technology companies as we choose. Um, and then in terms of how can we make sure it empowers farmers, I really think that you probably got this already, but engaging is the key. The more we can engage and talk to the technology world um, and recognize, you know, they're trying to do their best usually. Um, and they just really don't understand the distinctions of farming and what regenerative agriculture is um, and that soil health is even important. Like most people have no clue of that. Um, so, you know, whether that's how can we embed ourselves? Could you become like a paid non-exec board director uh, or board member for an ag tech startup? You know, they'll pay you like potentially a thousand pounds a month. Um, you do one or two phone calls and you're embedded in the company and uh, they really understand everything about what this technology might mean to you. Um, or could you maybe speak at a tech conference, you know, get paid for that. I don't know what it looks like necessarily, but I think we really need to engage if we want the technology to support what we're doing. So I'm going to stop there because I realize I've hit my 15 minutes. I did have some examples of uh, farming systems not in the US um, that are regenerative farming systems, but I can share those in slides and another time. Awesome. Wow, I mean, you, do, you did your homework. I mean, we, we asked you to, to, to touch on some pieces, but you did it really thoroughly. Thank you. I hope it was valuable uh, for the listeners. Um, so if we all now click on the right top button, the view, and then click, uh, what's it called, gallery? Then we can see each other, see who's still here. No, I'm kidding. Um, let's have a look. All right, the floor is yours, Peter. Wonderful. Thanks so much to uh, all the speakers for sharing all of their wonderful stories, experiences, insights, and ideas and suggestions. Um, together with what we've learned from the landscapes at Common Land, uh, sort of the harvesting and sharing that we've been doing over the last months and years, uh, I think we have a very rich collective intelligence in this. Uh, in this group here of uh, 84 participants uh, and we'd love to tap into some of that uh, and we'll be doing that in breakout rooms uh, so in a minute we'll be asking you to join a small breakout room of four people uh, and we'll be asking you to uh, introduce yourself and um, just share with each other based on a couple of questions and i've put them in the chat so you'll be able to access them as you're going into the breakout rooms 
um, but just to introduce them and you don't need to go through all of them maybe do a quick round of names and introductions but um, then talk about like on the one hand like what do you take with you or what's the bigger picture that's emerging from you from what you've been hearing uh, listening into these um, uh, yeah, into these uh, stories that have just been shared um, and then also uh, you could talk about what have you not yet heard so what's missing um, maybe a project that you've heard of that is uh, opposite from what has been presented or um, maybe you also see challenges moving forward in the, in the regenerative agriculture movement so we'd really love for you to really bring um, your observations and share with one another. Uh, we'll be in breakout rooms for about 15 minutes and when uh, you all come back we'll ask uh, some of you to share your insights um, via chat and also by unmuting. So uh, with that I would uh, uh, say uh, breakout room uh, invitation will show up in a couple of seconds. I wish you all wonderful uh, conversations. Please do turn off on your video um, and your microphone so you can share with one another. Uh, and we'll see you all back here in about 15 minutes. So enjoy everyone. And yes, Jan Maarten, that was, that was too short. Uh, we, when, once we start engaging with one another, um, we always want to uh, hear more and, and, and share more uh, and, and listen more into uh, sort of what's, uh, what's in the collective intelligence. Um, so thank you for acknowledging that. And uh, I think it's a sign of just how much richness there is in this group. Uh, and how much we can uh, share and learn from one another. Um, so I see Mario uh, uh, with a raised hand. So Mario, please unmute yourself and, and share with us what has come up for you. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, uh, I found all the presentations very inspiring and that I don't say that as a uh, open door, but I really meant it. Uh, what I found uh, very good to hear was, I work for Mondial FNFA, that is an international Solidarity Organization of the Trade Union FNV in the Netherlands. And what I found very good to hear was in the presentation of Lenny that there was so much focus and attention also on the position of workers and of uh, uh, working conditions and for living wage as a key also to, I think, to work with the, with the, employ the, the workers in the, in the banana plantations and to also get their involvement on this uh, regenerative agricultural processes. Uh, so I found that very inspiring because I'm starting to learn more about, uh, about the, uh, the environmental impact of, of things. But at the same time, I see that from the environmental organizations, we see a movement towards the more social aspects of these kind of programs. And I think we, we have much more possibilities to work together on these kind of programs. Uh, so. It was very inspiring to hear that example from Costa Rica. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so the, feel free to also share in the chat from other groups, um, but I also see Dieter, your hand was up. Yeah, thanks Peter. Thanks everyone for organizing and the presentations, really inspiring. Two things what really resonated for me was the one from Patagonia is like, how do can we shift roles, like not to see the consumer as a consumer, as a responsible citizen? What if we start doing that as well with farmers, not putting in the box as a farmer, but as a responsible citizen and as well see that he's a dad or a mom or a brother uh, and all that and then start a conversation from that point. I will be really curious what kind of conversations that will open. But as well, when we go talk to somebody of the government of some of business to say hey, you're a responsible citizen i'm as well we both human what can we do together so that was a really nice insight and the other thing what make me curious is what um the tech uh, i forgot the name around the tech is like set around a lot of the solutions what we create in tech embody still the uh, status quo and my question to this group is as well how much of the solutions we are creating for example, carbon credits or other things still embodies the status quo. And does it really help with a paradigm shift, like we say in common, a more holistic for returns paradigm than just a new solution, but it's still money driven. So that's a curiosity I take with out of this uh, out of this presentation. Thank you, Dieter. And I, I resonate with that. I was also very touched with, with that, uh, um, yeah, that, uh, that insight of like what role is technology going to play. So thank you. Um, Godfrey, you also wanted to share something with us. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Uh, I mean, um, all of the 
presentations were, were really nice. And uh, uh, what I wanted to know is from the one, one, two, three, uh, the presentation you put forward by Eleni. Um, when you look at the operations right now is dominated in um, Latin America and one country, Morocco, in Africa. So I just wanted to know like uh, which criteria do they use to determine where to invest? In. Um, also, I liked the, uh, the presentation by Abby Rose of uh, Vida Psycho. Um, as a, a biodiversity professional, whenever I, inter I interact with the people who are putting biodiversity conservation in, into the business, I really get excited. So you could see um, all the presenters, they highlighted the, uh, the value of integrating biodiversity into their farming system, whether it is uh, soil organisms or uh, above ground organisms. Um, uh, one thing also I didn't hear, uh, which is very important, uh, is approach used by common land. Because when you look the, the way common land goes about this uh, regenerative agriculture, they start with the landscape analysis, they integrate it with the uh, stakeholders analysis. So this is very important so that you, uh, you identify what are the really ideal landscape and the, 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 the proper partners to do the business. So I didn't cut this uh, final uh, point on landscape analysis and the stakeholder analysis from other presenters. So we would really like to know like, how do they establish their business? Otherwise, all the presentations were very nice and I'm really happy to join this webinar. Thanks. Thank you so much, Godfrey. And um, yeah, it's a, uh, also beautiful how also in the chat and in your story, there's lots of interesting questions coming up and it feels like, okay, there's so many more conversations to have had. Uh, but as we're nearing the end of this uh, session, um, I see one more raised hand from Joost. Yeah, thank you. Um, I found it very interesting conversations and um, they, uh, there was a lot of information on basically how farmers can be helped uh, to move towards more sustainable practices. What we have not discussed, I think, is who are these farmers? Um, because the farmer population is, is aging and uh, what I see around me is that a lot of new uh, non-farmers are coming into the farming world um, and starting to do things differently. But yeah, who, who are these people? And, and also, who is the big group of people that uh, might have more challenges to, to make the transformation? Uh, that's something that uh, sticks in my mind a bit. Thank you. Thank you, Joost. Um, and to all of us that are still here, there's about 70 of us, I believe there's still very many more uh, ideas, suggestions and, uh, and feedback and input for us in, as we move forward um, on this, uh, this mountain trail. Uh, so as we are uh, closing, before I hand over to uh, Willemijn, I'd just like to invite you to use the chat for any feedback on this session in terms of content or process, but also any tips or, or uh, sort of moving forward like uh, as we are moving forward collectively on this, uh, this journey of learning around regenerative agriculture, what are some of the things we could pay attention to? So what do you see out there that uh, we could uh, point the compass towards, so to say? So um, use these last five minutes just to fill the chat with uh, whatever you feel is relevant for all of us moving forward. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you and I'll hand back to Willemijn. Yes. Um, well, of course, these lessons learned are not something Common Land can uh, sort of take full credit for because it's really very much also the work of Weiland, Alvalal, Wide Open Agriculture, Living Lands Grounded, Regen WA, I mean, the list goes on. These are super strong local partners. And if Laura, Matthijs, Matt, do you guys want to reflect? Do you feel like you want to say something or are you happy? Laura's happy. I need to look for the other ones. Happy. I'm happy. I think we've got through stuff today. Cool. Good. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, we, we will share everything. We will compile the lessons learned, make them open to everyone and also open to everyone to engage with us and challenge us on those because we don't have all the answers, but we're trying to make sense of it all and trying to share as much as possible. 
Um, so yeah, we've been looking back six years of collaborating, um, ups and downs, highs and lows, uh, specifically on regenerative agriculture as well. Um, Grounded actually also wrote some beautiful blogs on that if you're interested in reading. Um, so grounded.co.za, we'll, we'll probably also share all those links. Um, so it's been a celebration. We should be proud of all the things we achieved, even though the odds are sometimes against us in this system change world that we're operating in. Uh, one thing that also struck me from the speakers and um, is that, you know, Hervé had this beautiful quote of the future is about people uh, going back to the ground, going outdoors, hands in the ground. And then also the story from Abby on technology um, is such an interesting combination. How do we sort of weave it in? I thought you nicely said that Abby, sort of weaving in technology in this regenerative holistic approach. And, and Lenny also so exciting to see you entering in the, into that field as one to tree where you're trying to balance this investor perspective and the groundedness of working on with living, living wage and people working in and on the land. I think it's a beautiful work that you're doing. Um, so if you want to stay engaged, please connect with us uh, directly or via fourturns.earth. It's basically a community platform that we're trying to facilitate more conversations about this, about this approach, about other people's approaches to really just spread the word so that, that we're not going to be hampered by information that is curated in a good way. So there's tools, stories, other landscapes you can explore. So warm welcome there. Um, and I thank you all for taking the time. I mean, it's super nice. Thank you speakers for preparing. Thank you, Harvestine. Thank you, Peter, Rose, Kira. Um, and uh, I hope we can do this again next year, maybe on business development or biodiversity. What do you think, Godfrey? <laughs> biodiversity is always a good thing. Um, so happy that you were all here. Thanks again. Have a nice evening, day, morning, and uh, stay engaged. <laughs> Thank Thanks, everyone. And as we're logging yeah. off, feel free to unmute and say goodbye in your own language. It's always a nice way of hearing from everyone.